of you guys can think back over your life and uh, think of a time when you were in an intimidating situation, but you found some courage, okay? I've been in a few intimidating situations in my life, not really ashamed to admit it. Um, in intimidation's a big deal. I want to tell you a story I read about uh, the governor of Massachusetts, one of the former governors. He was running for a second term, uh, and one day he had been out all day long working, chasing votes, and doing all those kinds of things. And so when he got to his church barbecue, it was late in the day. And um, he finally made it there. He had not eaten anything all day, and he was so hungry. And so he got his plate, and he started going down the line, and he got to the lady that was serving the barbecue chicken. And he stuck his plate out, and she put one piece of chicken on his plate. And he kind of stood there and looked around. He said, excuse me, ma'am. He said, do you mind if I have a, a second piece of chicken? She said, sorry, sir, but I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. He said, but I'm so hungry. And she said, I'm sorry. That's the rule. One per customer. And so finally, he thought he'd throw his weight around a little bit. He said, um, listen, lady, looked around and said, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. She looked around and said, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Now move on down the line. <laughs> On a more serious note, let me tell you another story about intimidation that uh, is a true story from 1989. Uh, there's a man named Ray Blankenship was awarded a um, silver life-saving medal from the coast from the U.S. Coast Guard because one morning in Ohio, when he was making breakfast. Um, he was probably cooking bacon because bacon's wonderful and everybody loves bacon, right? He was cooking breakfast and he looked out the window and uh, it had been raining in Ohio. If you, if you go back and I checked this out, if you go back and look in the Google map records and things, you'll see it flooded really bad. Um, he looked out the window and there was a big open storm, storm drain that ran beside his house and it was overflowing and he saw this young girl that had been swimming swept into the water and she was being carried down this storm drain and so Ray, Ray realized that not far from where they were that storm drain was going to go underground into a, a, a large drainage system that he knew would be flooded because it had been raining and the ground water table was high and he knew that if she went into that drain she was going to drown and so he left he left his breakfast and he ran outside and he dove into this um, this open flood drain and he grabbed this little girl and they were being carried down the drain headed to go underground and he, he was reaching out and he, he caught a piece of debris that had washed in and hung up on the side and he was able to pull himself and the little girl out and that's why the Coast Guard gave him the award but here's the cool part about it um, the intimidation of the water was more for Ray than a lot of people because he couldn't swim and had a fear of water. Now the neat thing about that is he had a split second to decide and he let his conviction that her life mattered outweigh uh, his intimidation and his fear of water. So I'll ask you again this morning, have you ever found courage in an intimidating situation? You know, we live our lives in America, around the world, no matter where we're on the globe, with the same enemy. The enemy is not people. The enemy is Satan. Uh, and Satan is an intimidator. He is uh, a master at it. I'm very careful when I teach about uh, Satan because uh, I've learned over the years that um, he is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at all times, but he has a lot of demons that inhabit places and yeah, they go to church and all that kind of stuff. So Satan can't read your mind, but he can hear what comes out of your mouth. So that's how he knows what you're communicating. And so I've just learned to be cautious. Now, I have no fear of him. But I will tell you this, he's good at what he does. He's been intimidating people for several millennia, okay? He's been, he's been mastering his craft of intimidation for a long period of time. And uh, we look just into the scripture, 
And we see over and over and over again the characteristic of the enemy is that he's an, an intimidator, especially of God's people. That's his goal. So uh, just quickly, just a few things. Uh, he enslaved the people of Israel in Egypt and then intimidated them because Pharaoh would not let them go and then chased them at the very end all the way to the Red Sea and literally had every intention of pushing them to their death or killing them. Uh, we all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're not, if you didn't grow up in church, and I remind myself that a lot of times because the first time I went to church, I did not know the church stories. Uh, these were three young Hebrew men that were in a foreign land, and the king built this huge statue of himself and demanded that they fall down in worship. And anybody who would not worship, he would cast them into this huge furnace. And the story goes they did not bow down and God delivered them. But the point I'm making is he intimidated the people of God. And then there's Daniel. Uh, if you grew up in church or went to Sunday school, you remember the little pictures of Daniel and the, the Sunday school stories of Daniel who was told not to pray, but he prayed and he was thrown into the lion's den. And King Xerxes and his attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. And then even in the New Testament, when Peter and John and James would preach the gospel, the Pharisees would threaten them and beat them with physical uh, uh, whippings and then send them out and tell them, don't you dare preach again in the name of the Lord. In Rome, as we go through history from biblical account in the first century, uh, the number of Christians that were martyred, uh, first century Christians that were martyred uh, in Rome is, is astounding and around the world. And even the famous Apostle Paul, who is said to have been beheaded under the Roman Emperor Nero, who was a lunatic. And we move on down to Hitler and the Holocaust. And even as recent as ISIS and the attacks on the Coptic Egyptian Christians and on and on and on. And there's China's current persecution of the underground church that uh, the world media is silent on and the, the atrocities in Sudan and all these different places. You say, Pastor, where are you going with this? Here's where I'm going. The reality is that human history is one long reoccurring list of people influenced by Satan to try to intimidate and to hurt other people, especially God's people. So, Pastor, why are you saying that? Here's what I want you to get. It's not new. I hear people all the time say, well, the way it's going these days, friends, these days have always been these days. Satan's no more of a meanie today than he was back then. He's the, the same evil fallen angel that's been mastering his craft for millennia, and Satan is an intimidator. What he wants for your life as a Christian and for the church is to intimidate you and me so that we don't rise up to the call that God has for the kingdom. Now he does it in a couple of different ways in some parts of our world. He intimidates God's people through physical violence. Uh, we live in a wonderful country but there are places in this world um, if you get, got some of the information that I get from missionaries that are not published due to he uh, safety reasons, there are, there are places all over this world where people literally are still serving Jesus under the threat of torture and death. That's real. That's not a story. That's not something out of a movie. And thank the Lord that we're not facing that in America, but there are other tactics of intimidation, okay? Uh, Satan uses things like political and social tactics that are designed to try to intimidate the, the people of God. Uh, one is political correctness, and the other uh, in our current day is this complete sh sham of what many refer to as the intolerance of tolerance, uh, referring to this modern misuse of the concept of tolerance. Uh, in America, tolerance doesn't mean what it means in every other part of the world. In America, tolerance means neutrality for everything except Christianity, everything but biblical Christianity. That's what tolerance 
tolerance means today. It means that you can be anything you want to be, believe anything you want to believe, say anything you want to say, as long as it's not fundamental biblical Christianity. And so these are intimidation tactics. And here's the reason I'm sharing this with you as my lead in, okay? Because every one of us have faced it and will continue to in America. Um, I've shared this with you because the enemy's agenda to intimidate is not new, but what happens is it gets repackaged in every generation and in every culture. It finds a way, he finds a way to um, repackage it in, in a toolbox that will will fit the job. Sometimes, again, this is not to give glory to the enemy. If you stay with me, you'll hear me work this out. But sometimes he's much more strategic than the Christian people are in, in his attempts at working. And one of the greatest... Um, one of the greatest successes Satan has had in the modern Christian church is to convince us to fight the wrong battles. Okay, He's very, very good at drawing us into the wrong fights because he knows, number one, it'll cost us our influence for lost people. And number two, he knows that it will suck all of our energy and effort into the wrong thing and we won't have the energy and the effort to put into the right things. Okay, So we got to make sure our battles are the right ones. But listen, I'm not, I wanted to lead in with that, but that's not the rest of the message. We're in a series, uh, The Call. This is part number three. Um, because God is calling the people who will find the courage to rise just like he has in every generation he's doing it today. In all those stories I read to you from uh, from ancient Egypt all the way, uh, or from uh, yeah, from ancient Egypt all the way through antiquity, even in modern times, Satan has been an intimidator and God has been calling the people who would rise up in courage and carry out the will of God. So I want to share this morning in part number three that all of these people that I mentioned who rose to the call, all of these people uh, prevailed either in this life or in the next. Let us not forget as Christian people that death is not a defense feet for Christians. I don't enjoy saying that and I don't think that's something I want to run around hoping will happen to me, but I think we've got a soft spine in, in the Western world because we, we tend to think that death is finality, but for you and I, death is not the end. It's not defeat at all. Paul said, oh grave, where is thy victory? And oh death, where is thy sting? Okay, it is not the end. And so all these people that were intimidated or who Satan tried to intimidate, when they rose to the call, they prevailed in this life or the next. So today I want to talk about David and share a few um, thoughts from his life about how we can engage, how we can cultivate courage when we are faced with intimidating situations. And I kind of feel like I'm doing this. So if you see me looking up, I got this odd look on my face. This thing is massive. I, we're going to have to cut it down or something. I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> Get me a block. A pla I'm going to build a platform on the platform where I can stand. Anyway, today I want to share from 1 Samuel 17, verses 28, 29. Normally I don't use uh, the King James or the New King James, but I want to read it today. Verse number 28 says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. This is talking about David. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much today uh, that you are calling to people who will hear your voice and realize that we are not called to some passive existence, but we are called to be missionaries in our homes and in our jobs and our culture right here at home uh, for the kingdom of God. I know the enemy will try to intimidate every person in this room, every person watching this uh, on our channel. God, but I pray today that you'll help us cultivate the courage to answer the call 
in Jesus' name as you have done for countless thousands in the past. We praise you for it. All glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So David, David, just to give you a background in this story, this is the, this is the famous story of David and Goliath. So again, if you were not raised in church, the short story is Goliath was a bad dude. David was a little, kind of a little punky looking kid, young man, and David killed the giant with a slingshot. That's the short version, okay? But there was a lot more in this and the whole army of Israel was intimidated. They were hiding. And every day, uh, Goliath, who most his, most scholars would estimate it being a little over nine foot, and I always laugh at pastors who try to get it to the exact inch. I'm like, dude, who cares if it's nine one or nine seven? Can you imagine fighting a nine foot person? Another eight inch, whatever. You know what I'm saying? He was a big dude, okay? And he would come out every day and he would march in front of the army and he would curse the God of Israel and he would say all these terrible things and Israel was so intimidated with fear that day after day after day they just hid and they cowered down and David who was not even uh, in the army came to check on his brothers and he in talking to them happened to hear Goliath as he marched around and used all the uh, the profanities over the God of Israel and all the things that he said and something happened in David that did not happen in anybody else in that army. David heard the call from his conviction. And his conviction produced a courage because David knew that God expected him to be accountable for what he knew. Now, we need seat belts in our pews sometimes because if we had them, I'd tell you to buckle up and fix and take you on, on, a, on a journey. If you know what you think you, you're telling me you know about Christianity and the kingdom of God, then friend, I want you to know if nobody's ever told you this, and they probably have, you are accountable before the Lord for doing what you know. This is not a passive spiritual existence where we all get to heaven because we shook the preacher's hand and got dunked in water. It is when you and I are born again, God calls us into the family of God and the church of Christ, Jesus Christ, and we are called to the mission field. And if we know the Lord as a savior and we know Satan as a deceiver and we know that people are dying and going to hell every day and that we know that the lostness of humanity is not going to be changed by anything but the message of Jesus, if we know that, we are accountable to that. David knew that this man was cursing God. He knew that this giant, which he never even called a giant, he knew that he was cursing everything about God and the people of Israel. And it was the conviction in his heart that, hey, he can't say that about God. He can't say that about the kingdom of God that calls David to find courage from conviction. So what I want to tell you this morning is I believe God is still looking for people who will be accountable to what they know and follow the call to share Christ with the culture regardless of the opposition. And listen, if you're hearing me for the first time, the opposition that I'm talking about is probably the opposite of what you're thinking. I'm not talking about going out there with signs and picketing on the corner and people can do whatever they want to do. I'm not saying I'm for or against that. That's not my point. I'm talking about being willing to do the hard work of loving people who are so different from me they scare me. Yeah. I'm talking about doing the hard work of building relationships with people that I don't agree with so that I can share the gospel. I'm not talking about uh, uh, boycotts and all that kind of stuff. That You do whatever you want. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the real battle of engaging culture from the inside because you, you and I are going to be intimidated at times. We're going to find even a hostile environment. Um, I won't make a, I won't go into a sidebar about this, but I will tell you, we are not far in America 
if we're not already there, from not only a culture who doesn't believe in Christianity, we're on the edge of a culture that is openly hostile towards Christianity. Very, very close, okay? And so we need a conviction that will produce courage greater than our fears. A conviction that will produce courage greater than our fears. It's happened in in history. It's happened in the Bible. And I believe God is still doing it today. So, So David hears this. And here's what David says. He says, what's going to be done for the man that kills this giant? What's going to be, we can't let this go on. And his brothers try to silence him. And David says, hey, is there not a cause? Is there not something going on? And and, and the thing I want to share with you is that the way we have conviction that produces courage is we've got to be aware of the call. I I am... um, I am sure that too many of those Israelites were uh, oblivious to the real battle that was taking place that day. The real battle, the spiritual battle between the forces of darkness and the forces of God and all that the enemy represented toward the people of God. And David heard what they were either unwilling to hear or what they could not hear and that that was a call to step up for the Lord. Now, I will tell you that you and I I've got to understand the call in our day. Across, a, across America and, and, and specifically and around the world, there are people in churches all over America today. Let's say America. Let's talk about America. Who have no concept of what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you guys because I think God's doing a thing in Knollwood that's, that's very special. But people go to church and they have no, maybe they just choose not to hear that the call is to something more important than a social event or some type of, uh, you know, a part of their week that just makes them a better person. I used to say it like this, becoming a Christian uh, is not, we don't add God to our life like an accessory to our wardrobe. He's not our tie that we add to all the other cool things we are. When you and I, or at least the way I I read it, when you and I submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we are submitting ourselves 100% to His authority and His voice and His direction in our life, and that is a missional call to get to, to get into our to our world as we leave here. So church church is kind of a celebratory time, and our mission's not in here. You've heard it said a million times. Our mission is out there, and so we've got to we've got to be willing to hear hear this call that if we don't move in our season that people are at stake and God will raise up people that will. So I want to read a verse to you out of 1 Chronicles 12 and 32. It's listing, uh, if you read Chronicles, there's a section in there where the mighty men of David are being listed and the people who are valuable to the plan of God are being listed. And so in this verse, it says, And of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. This verse says that that there is value on those in every generation who understand what's going on around them and have a sense of what to do about it. This is those who can hear the voice of the Lord calling to them for the kingdom in the middle of the the, the chaos and the screaming noise of, uh, of of the world around us. It's those who have such a conviction that they can't not follow the plan of God. It's that conviction that even in the face of intimidation pushes and drives us and calls us to share the story of Jesus even when we know we may be in a hostile environment. Josh McDowell said, having convictions can be defined as being so thoroughly convinced that Christ and his word are both uh, objectively true and relationally meaningful that you act on your beliefs regardless of the consequences. This is the call I'm talking about. I'm not talking about call to full-time service or to go to another country. It may be God's plan. I'm talking about the call that I hear that says, Joe, if Jesus is who he says he is, and he's who you think he is, and he's who you are, he is to your life, and he's called you to do what the Bible says, then you can't not engage those around you for the kingdom of God. So David listened and he said, does anybody else hear what I'm hearing? I think God is trying to say to the church in America, 
quit listening to the noise and listen to me. Hear, hear me calling you out of all of the stuff that, that, that the church has historically gotten so wrapped up in that it drained the energy and it drained the effort from, from, from the everyday work of sharing the story with Jesus. And then David goes on and says, hey, who is this that's going to be allowed to defy the armies of the living God? He had conviction. He also had passion. He had passion to do what God had called him to do. And listen, this story is so bizarre because David is the least qualified by worldly standards of anybody on that whole battlefield. He is like the last person. Okay, I'll tell you what. For those of you who don't know the story, when, when they finally decide they're going to let him go to battle, they take him to King Saul, and Saul tries to put armor on him. Have you ever seen a little kid try to put on his daddy's coat? And it just falls off and the arms are dragging the floor. That's kind of what it looked like on David. It was hanging off of him. It didn't fit because he didn't have the frame of a trained warrior. And they said, you can't go. And David said, somebody's got to go. He can't be allowed to keep saying what he's saying. David said, I'm so moved that I can't. And, 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 and when I'm surrounded by, by just multitudes of silence, he said, I can't be quiet. I can't. I'm so moved. Because of my passion for God, you know, the same exact thing happened to Isaiah. So many times when we think about Isaiah getting into the presence of God, we think about how he cried out and said, holy is the Lord and I'm too sinful. But there's more to that. Isaiah 6 and 8, he heard the voice of the Lord and he said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah was so moved that the answer is always, here am I, send me. When you hear the call, the answer is never your neighbor. The answer is never the political party that you believe in. The answer is never the organization you affiliate yourself with. The answer is never somebody else. The answer is always, send me. Lord, who's going to win my family? Send me. Who's going to win my office? Send me. Who's going to win my generation? Send me. Deliverance never comes from the outside. It may, it may be populated on the outside, but it begins on the inside. David, Isaiah said, and then Jehu was the same thing. I shared this verse a few weeks ago in 1 Chronicles 10 and 16. Jehu got so moved by his passion for God that he said to uh, King Ahab, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And, and he, he got so fired up that he wanted people to know that he was passionate about it. We've got to be moved to stand up to the call that we hear. And I could go on and on and on, but what about Nehemiah? who was living in the king's palace as cupbearer to the king, living in a plush environment with no worries. But when he heard that the walls in Jerusalem were lying in rubble, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat, he couldn't get around because of the burden in his heart. And he was so moved by what he heard that he acted upon it. You know, uh, someone said even a coward can praise God, but it takes a man of courage to follow God. When you and I hear this call, the passion will move us. And, and I, I, in the risk of sounding old school here, and I'm okay with that, I think we need to be moved again. I think the church needs a burden. A burden not for, like I said, all the, not all the peripheral stuff. Not for the stuff that people see. But a burden for sharing the story of Jesus with somebody. You know, we think about this sometimes and we get this big picture in our mind on how we win the world. And we, win, we don't win the world by winning the world. We win the world by winning our neighbor. Yeah. We win the world by winning a family member. We win the world by showing kindness to somebody who doesn't expect it to come from us because we're different than they are. That's how we win the world. David went out and drew up the battle lines. If you've been in church, you know this story. And man, Goliath had a field day when he saw him. He made fun of him. He ridiculed him. He cursed God. He said, who are you? I'm a warrior, been trained from my youth for battle. You're a shepherd. And by the way, as all of you probably already know, a shepherd's not, we, we think shepherds are like highly esteemed because they're part of our Christian tradition. They were not highly esteemed. They were about the lowest particular job you could have in that culture. Okay. That's why he wasn't in the 
the war because his daddy sent the one that he didn't have confidence in. How you know he didn't have confidence in him? Because when the prophet came and said, bring out your sons, he didn't even bring him out. Talk about dysfunction. He didn't even bring him out. And he shows up and he finally goes out to the battle and the, the, the Philistine starts saying to him, I'm going to do this to you and I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air. And he just, you know, runs his mouth. And, and what David says is a key to understanding that the source of true spiritual power and the identity of the real enemy are critical to you and I being able to accomplish this call. These two things. David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. That represented all the tactical, strategic weaponry of the enemy, of some of the best trained soldiers in the world. David said, yeah, you're coming at me with all of that. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, here it is, whom you have defied. David said, we didn't start this battle. You started it because you have drawn lines against the Lord. Friends, I want to tell you something. For you and I to follow the call of God, we've got to know the source of real power. And I can tell you, I can tell you who it's not. It's not me or you. I don't care how many people you breathed on and they fell down. I don't care how many people you hit with your jacket and knocked them down. I don't care how many times someone has talked about how many goosebumps and doodads they had when you were taught. You are not, I am not the source of spiritual power. Do you remember in the New Testament when Paul was casting out devils and the seven sons of a man named Sceva heard about it? And so they decided they would try it and they adjured the demonic in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the Bible says the demon spirit in that man beat the clothes off of them and sent them out running through the city and here Here's what he said. He said, uh, God I know, Jesus I know, and Paul I've heard of, but who are you? The source of power is not in us. It was in the name of the Lord. David understood that if he was going to fight a battle bigger than he is, he had to engage it in power that was bigger than he was. And he knew that that little rock and that sling, I don't care, and I've heard people talk about how skilled David was and yes I've seen people light matches with slingshots and all that kind of stuff. I know there were people who were really powerful warriors with slingshots but he didn't kill a nine foot something tall giant with a slingshot because he was that powerful. David understood that it was the anointing of God on top of his effort and his conviction and his courage. It's when he engaged all he could do that he stepped out in faith that God would do what he could not do because he was not going in the name of David. I think the greatest thing that the, the greatest thing wrong with the church in America today is we all want to do church in the name of our church or the name of our pastor or the name of our denomination or the name of our group. Listen, no, there's no power in any of that. I don't care who or she, he or she is. It's in the name of the Lord. And the second thing Ephesians 6 says, by the way, that we don't fight against um, flesh and blood. So the second thing is... The enemy is never people. Please hear me. Never, ever people. Ephesians 6 says that you and I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The Israelites weren't wrestling against Pharaoh. Daniel wasn't wrestling against the king. Paul wasn't wrestling against Nero. Jesus wasn't wrestling against the Pharisees. All of these people were the vehicle and the tools that the real enemy used, but they were not the real enemy. You know, one of the saddest stories in all of Scripture is the story of Judas, who ended up being a pawn of the devil and had the very presence of Jesus Christ. And Jesus rebuked the devil in Peter and Judas. Peter wasn't the enemy. Judas wasn't the enemy. Satan was the enemy. So, Pastor, what do we do with people who intimidate us? We love people and we pray against the spiritual influence that they are manipulated by. And when I find myself wanting to engage the person, I got to realize that I'm being pulled into the realm of Satan's warfare. Hear me, friends. You and I cannot beat him in the flesh. 
I don't care who you are. You do not have the power outside of the Lord and the Holy Spirit to engage the devil. He will win every time. So what he tries to do is draw us out into the battle, uh, into the realm where he can win. And that is engaging people, battling in the flesh. The enemy is not people, and the power is in the name of the Lord. So how do we push back darkness, Pastor? Do we, you know, and I listen, I get it. Friends, I get it. I, I got saved in um, traditional Pentecost. I get it. I, I know that we get amped up. I know that we get fired up and saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I get all that. I, I am. I'm a spirit-filled person. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat under a sermon or left a worship environment when I felt like I could uh, charge hell with a water pistol half full and win. I mean, I was just amped up. I get it. I believe we need that passion and that zeal. But we've got to make sure that we don't waste it on the wrong enemy. In fact, Fighting the wrong battles when it's never people. It's always enemies. So how do we do it, Pastor? We push back darkness by walking in the light. We act in the name of Jesus. We love in the name of Jesus. We stand in Jesus' name. We speak in Jesus' name. We serve. We teach. We give. Everything we do in the name of Jesus. Pastor, how did he do that? Did he draw out lines and combat the, the Roman Empire? No, he loved the unlovable. He touched the untouchable. He went where nobody else wanted to go and offered hope to people that nobody else had time for. If you really want to see the battle tactic of Jesus, you've got to realize that he was a voice to those who were hungry and he didn't draw out those who were in power. Have you ever stopped and thought about the fact that God could have, Jesus could have been, chose to have been born in any generation, in any culture in the whole world, right? We know he didn't have to choose when he did. And yet he was born into a time that's not so very different than ours. The Jewish people were living under the occupation of the Roman Empire. One of the most brutal regimes to take ownership and occupation on foreign soil that history has ever recorded. They did not have control of their own uh, political system. They didn't have control in many times of their own money. They were not a free and an autonomous people. And Jesus was born into that culture. And the way we think about it sometimes, we would expect him to be a revolutionary that would overthrow Nero. And we're coming up on Passion Week. That is why most of the Jewish people missed him because that's what they were hoping he would do. The temptation for us is still there to battle worldly systems. We want to draw these lines and take on these fights and posture up and all this stuff. And I'm not talking about standing for what you believe in. I'm talking about being sucked in to a battle that you can never win. Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Whig. Friends, we're not going to win the world through politics. You know what we're going to do through politics? We're going to make people, we're going to make it worse. If we think that we're going to liberate America through, through politics, we're going to make it worse. Now, I do my homework and I vote. I vote my convictions. I believe every American should do that. But listen, the Bible was written long before the Constitution. Long before the Declaration of Independence. Long before the pilgrims ever uh, set sail. What I'm trying to say is that the Bible is far larger than all of that. And, and the power for you and I to win, uh, I see you guys are getting cold. D, you may have to crank it down a little bit. The power to win is going to come when we identify the right enemy and we operate in the right power, which is the name of the Lord Jesus. And the call is sounding in our day. And I, I can tell I'm rambling, so I'm going to move. I'm going to shut this down, okay? David's story, I learned a long time ago that it's so much better. Uh, and I try to tell young speakers this all the time. It is so much better when you quit for people to say, man, I wish he'd have kept going. than for people to sit there and say, God, I wish he'd shut up. Okay, so trying to quit early. That's the truth, by the way. Always the truth. David's story teaches us that we need, pa we need to understand the call and we need passion and we need to trust in the Lord and, and we need to make sure we're battling the right enemy and fighting the right things. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit will give us conviction that will produce courage greater than our fears and we will not allow the intimidation of our day 
to um, stop us from the call of God. So uh, uh, Wayne Smith, the general superintendent of the Wesleyan Church said, if you have courage, you will influence people based on your convictions. If you lack courage, you'll influence people based on your comfort zones. Courage will take you anywhere you believe God is leading you. But without courage, you are going to go where you are comfortable. And Adrian Rogers, one of my favorites, said, Faith is not believing God in spite of the evidence. Faith is believing God in spite of the consequences. That's real faith in our culture. I close with this story. How many of you have heard of the Orange Revolution before? A couple of you. Okay. The Orange Revolution in 2004. Um, this is a story told by author Philip Yancey, but it was a, it was a uh, global story. It was the 2004 election in Ukraine. And the, there was a, the reformer, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, was challenging the ruling party, who was an entrenched party. They were a, um, a um, corrupt political system, and he was challenging it. And on election day, the polls showed that Yushchenko it was enjoying a comfortable lead. But what happened is that the government reversed the results. And uh, I want to share with you what Philip Yancey said in his book, What Good is God? God. He describes this electoral fiasco, and here's what he says. He says, that evening, the state-run television reported, ladies and gentlemen, we announced that the challenger, Victor Yushchenko, has been decisively defeated. Now, bear in mind, this is not true. He's, the government said, however, he's been defeated. But government authorities had not taken into account one small insignificant, hear what I'm saying, piece of their broadcast, and that was in the bottom corner of the television was a lady interpreting for the deaf, who heard them speak in her language and interpreted for the deaf, for the hearing, hearing impaired. And in the small lower right-hand corner of the television, this brave woman who was raised by uh, deaf-mute parents refused to sign the lie. And she signed the truth. And she said, gave a different message. And she said, I am addressing all the deaf citizens of Ukraine. Don't believe what they say. They're lying. And I'm ashamed to translate these lies. Yushchenko is our president. No one in the studio understood her because no one knew sign language. And inspired by her courage, deaf people all over the Ukraine started getting together and speaking out. And this is what started what you and I now know as the Orange Revolution. The word orange has always been a color that means change. And they texted their friends on their phones about the fraudulent election, elections and journalists began to hear about it. And they stopped uh, broadcasting. They took courage and stopped broadcasting under the fear of prison what the state-run government was saying. And over the next few weeks, listen to this, a million people wearing orange flooded the capital city and demanded new elections. The government that was entrenched buckled under the pressure and gave in to new elections and Yushchenko won, of course, in a landslide as the undisputed winner. Now here's what Philip Yancey said. This is what got me. He said, when I heard the story behind the Orange Revolution, the image of a small screen of truth in the corner of a big screen of lies became an ideal picture for the church in America. You see, we don't control the big screen. That's what we want, and that's what we think we're going to get. We're not the big screen, friends. Not anymore. But we are the truth-telling portion in the corner, in the right-hand corner the screen and he went on to say throughout history nations have glorified winners that were not winners but losers but then like the sign language translator in the lower right hand of the corner along comes a person named Jesus who in effect says don't believe the big screen they're lying 
friends, you and I don't change the world from the outside on the big screen. We change the world on the inside one heart at a time. And we're not called to save the fallen systems of this world. We're called to kindly and lovingly and consistently give people a glimpse of an alternative way to live. Jesus had a name for it. It's the subject he preached on more than any other subject. It's called the kingdom of God. And you know, there's another term for the kingdom of God and the work of Jesus. It's called a revolution. And this revolution has began and it's calling. And this is the call that we're trying to get every Christian that we can to hear. Not to call for the big screen. To call to revolution that is living our faith out one person at a time, one kind act at a time, one small gesture at a time. You know, here at Knollwood, um, we believe everyone matters. Everybody. And we believe anything's possible. Because we don't have to control the world. we just got to live our faith. And that seed of revolution has been turning the world upside down for over 2,000 years. They've tried to burn the Bibles. They've tried to murder Christians. They've tried to ban the church. And the more the corruptness of this fallen world squeezes, the more the church grows. Because in the big screen of the lies, there's this little portion of truth. And I get to have my little portion of it. And that's how I treat people. That's when I'm kind to my people serving my love. That's when I'm able to share with somebody that didn't treat me right, the goodness of God. When I can just live out my faith in a way that people say, you know, I don't know everything about that, but that person has a little something that I'm not sure I have. That alternative way and the seed of revolution changed the world. Would you bow your heads with me? The call. Can you hear it? Will you follow it? If you're in this room today and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, but you would like to, and friends, by the way, this morning, I don't care if it's the first time you ever got saved or your back slid or whatever. I, the, the older I get, the less I care about those kinds of terms and, and trying to qualify certain restrictions. I just want to know, are you right with God? That's all I care about this morning. If you're not right with the Lord right now, in this moment, regardless of your past, if you're not right with God in this moment, would you slip your hand up so we can pray with you and you can be? Call it what you want. We just don't want you to miss it. Is there anybody today, if you got your hand up, hold it high. Thank you for that hand. I do not want to miss you. Thank you for both of those hands. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I believe you're the Son of God. Whether it's the first time or a new time, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name. And Father, I pray over this body today and all those that would be watching by television. Never in my life and in my two decades of ministry, Lord, have I ever felt such a stirring and such a call. That you are trying to get your message, not to the lost world so much, but to the church. To carry the message to the lost. That we are called to live out our faith in the daily routines of life. That we can be the people you've called us to be in this revolution called the kingdom of God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.